I met Carlinhos in 1980, and uh, around that time, okay. and more or less, and uh, there were a handful of Asians at this time, and now we have so many people, so many uh, young investigators, so uh, how many, a lot of bright people, and it's excellent to see all this amazing growth. See, at, at that time, uh, my area was population genetics, so I started in, a, in an area that is not pure statistics. And coincidentally, uh, a big enemy of Asian statistics was Ronald Fisher. He's one of the founders of population genetics. And uh, this work here, it's, uh, it's a very applied work. And uh, since I'm my grandfather now, I, I'd like to give you some advice for the, the young people coming here to the to, to, to statistics. See, uh, uh, statistics is it's really uh, and, and again, it's, it's, I'm not biased because uh, I consider myself a little bit of a statistician. But it's the, the most important core uh, area in, for study. And why is that? See, if you think any organism that we call alive, or more or less alive as viruses, they are constantly making decisions. And good decisions are rewarded with survival. And this applies to uh, individuals, to cells, uh, to societies. So, and who studies decision processes? Statisticians. So, and uh, the, the, all science is based on, on decisions. So, we are very special. See, we are, sometimes we forget about that, or even better, we don't realize that, so we are not very, like, uh, brag about that, how important I am. But, but we really do something very important. And, and one thing that is complicated also about statisticians is that we have this duality. See, statistics is an impure mathematical science because we deal with reality too. And most of the time we, we are interested on how to solve a problem. And we have a problem and we try to find a solution. And that's my piece of advice. See, because we are so uh, elaborated in the intricacies of the mathematics techniques that we need to use to solve our problems, that many of the presentations I've seen here, if I didn't know about them before, I couldn't understand them. You, people forget that you have a problem and you want to solve the problem. And it's very important, see, because once, uh, uh, most of the time, uh, the, the presenter is the person that knows about that uh, problem the most. And, the most important thing is not the problem anymore, but is the solution. But for the rest of the world, we need to understand that. That's it, that's the problem, that's what I want to solve. And then everybody follows that, because even if you don't understand all the details of the solution, uh, what each of us is trying to do is provide some solution. That is a joke that I heard many times ago, we publish and hardly anybody reads that. And if someone's really disagree and write another paper, okay? So let's go to our uh, idea here. So, so this is my story. Uh, in the past, uh, since uh, 98, I have been working with uh, uh, this problem of how to find a dose uh, of a new agent that is going to be used in a human. Uh, and then, see, this is the old story, so I'm going to give you a, a, a very brief overview about that. Then we have the present. The present is the motivation of this talk. See, in a nutshell what happened, see we have this method that had been used for a long time, and we, as it happens many, many, many times, we submit a, a, a protocol that is the unit of a clinical trial to FDA. FDA is the, the big brother. Uh, is the agency that uh, accepts and controls all this type of research in humans in the United States. And they said, no, you cannot use that method. So what do I do? Nothing. See, I need to agree with them. See, they are the, they decide. But then, afterwards, what we can do, we can prove that they are wrong. So this is uh, what we are going to do here. And in a sense, most of the work that I'm going to do, or I'm going to present to you, that, that motivates this topic, it's a simulation uh, work. It's a very tedious simulation work. But again, uh, Although it's not the most uh, amazing things that statisticians like to do, 
it's really very important because we can only uh, show that what we are doing is better or worthwhile if we prove that our stuff is better than other stuff. See, if we can show that our methods are more efficient than frequentist methods, we win one battle. And that's what we need to do too. See, most of the time, the cool stuff is to come up with a new method, to find new ways to solve problems, and that's it. No, no, this is just half of the work. After that, you need to show to everybody that this is better than what is around that was done before you. And that's less fun. See, it takes more work to do. And the future work that hopefully some of you will be interested and you'd like to work together is how we work in uh, those combinations. Okay, so, so this is cancer. Uh, it's a crazy cell in your cell that starts to grow and uh, because it's a cell of your own, it's really hard to kill that cell. And the cell has all the uh, smart things that evolution gave us. It tries to uh, create new mutations to uh, evade any mechanism to destroy that cell. So if I find something that destroys one clone of cells, another one will pop up with different mutations and will try to kill us. See, the, the cancer cells are very selfish. They want to exist, but they don't know that for them to exist, uh, they kill the host, and that's the problem. So most of the time when you need to find a, a drug to kill those cells, uh, it's not something pleasant. Although very rarely and recently they come with this called uh, uh, targeted therapies. Uh, see, anything in some way it kills you, including water. If you drink too much water, see, you will die. That's why people in marathon sometimes die because they drink too much water. So, but these are drugs that are designed to kill some cells, for example, that are dividing too much. And, uh, the first thing that you do after experimenting with animals is to have a trial with human. And it's a very complicated trial because you need to find what? You need to find a dose uh, for, to apply to other studies. And uh, why this study is different? See, what is the characteristic of this drug finding study? Uh, trials that measure efficacy of treatment normally takes a long time. So in this first study, what you want to do is to find a dose that is reasonable. So the first concept that we have up here, it's called the dose limiting toxicity. So physicians, what they have done in the past is they created a scale that from zero to five. Zero is everything fine, five you are dead. And in between one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and four are degrees of uh, toxicity that this agent produces on you. Uh, most of the time, three and four is really bad, two is more or less. So, we are going to handle first with three and four. Three and four uh, and five is going to be called dose limiting toxicity or DLT. So, what you have in this axis here is the probability of DLT, and here you have your dose. And what you want to find, you want to find uh, some dose that you produce a given percent theta of uh, toxicity of this DOT. And see, this is how you solve the problem. You need to find the dose such that the probability of DOT is failed. And uh, that dose is called MTD, maximum tolerated dose. There is a couple of other synonyms for that, and we're going to use MTD and gamma for this. And another important uh, parameter here is this rho zero. Uh, when you take your first dose, this is the probability of toxicity here. As you see, most of the time, or always, this is going to be less than your data. Oh, and this, oops, and this function here, this function here is monotonically increasing. That's the only requirement that you need. Okay, so we can refine our definition that the major objective in a dose finding uh, trial or phase one trial is to estimate the dose such that the proportion of data patients is going to exhibit DOT. Okay, so now statisticians are more relaxed. So we need to estimate things. So if you want to estimate things, what are the typical important things? You want to measure your bias and your precision, your mean square error. And you know all those formulas by heart. Uh, also, what you'd like to do is to have a consistent a procedure that you converge in probability to that value. 
But one thing that you see, and that's the interaction with reality that is very, very important, you want this method to be safe. You don't want uh, your patients to get a lot of DOTs. See, what is the optimal solution for this problem? You take the first dose, very low, give to a group of people, one person, and see no DOT. Then you take a very high dose and give to another person, this person dies. Aha! You know that the solution is in between, and then you iterate, so you have very fast algorithms to find your MTD. But that's unethical. So you need to figure out a way that you converge to your uh, MTD from below. And that's the trick of this area. And one, so one, um, one thing that you, we need to worry is about the patient population. So who is the patient population that enrolls in this type of trials? Are people that tried uh, the standard treatment? Failed. Go to second line? Failed. Third line? Failed. Fourth line? Failed. So you have a patient that after trying many types of therapy, he still has cancer. So these are the guys that are getting into those trials. And in the past, uh, the assumption is that, uh, see, they are, when they enroll to this trial, they're just doing something good for science, because they're helping the rest of the society, because there is not much chance they will benefit from this trial. But uh, hopefully, uh, in this paper that was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2005, they reviewed a, a large series of patients that enrolled in this type of trial, more than 10,000, and they realized for everybody's surprise that there is more than 10% of chance that they will benefit from that. So, see, this is really cool because now there is another thing that we need to add to our list of desirable properties of, of our method. We want to design trials such that the maximum number of patients will be receiving the optimal dose. If I can uh, make this happen, I'm going to take that number, 10%, maybe increase to 15%, so just by changing the way I design my trial. So, we added that to the list. We not only want accurate, precise, consistent, and safe, but we want to maximize the number of patients that are going to be receiving the optimal dose. And how do we define the optimal dose? How about 15% around the true MTD? Okay, so this is uh, uh, segment one, generality. That's the method that we developed uh, in 1998, escalation with overdose control. Uh, this method is an adaptive design. That is an experiment, experimental design where future points of experimentation are based on previous points of experimentation. And that's See, a very large and the best class of adaptive design are major designs, and you're all familiar with that. See, and you have your priors, your likelihood functions, cost functions, posterior, you have your data, you have your learning machine there. Okay, so and that's uh, a newer concept for some of you, although it was presented by uh, Akron and Zachs. Akron was a, a student of Zachs in 1973 in a JASA paper. And this idea that why do you read this the, the math that I'm not going to explain to you, it's a very clever idea. If I have, suppose that I want to estimate the mean of some uh, distribution, and as I increase my sample size, what happens to it is going to get narrower and narrower and narrower. But uh, how about if instead of giving uh, the most likely value of my, my estimate every time, I give a fraction of that. See, I, I find a fractile, an alpha fractile, and I give that in the lower side. Because as my uh, distribution gets narrower and narrower, that value is going to be converged to the true value, to the most likely value to it. So this is uh, the intrinsic idea that we are going to use in our method to converge from below. Because, for example, to put some reality on that, this was the first trial that we used uh, EWAC in 1998. Instead of, uh, this is your posterior distribution of the MTD, these are possible values of this drug, uh, 5FU. Instead of giving this value to my next patient, I'm going to give a slightly smaller value. Because, see, this is the beginning of my trial. I'm not really sure if this is too low or too high, but if I use uh, this 25% uh, fractile here, that's much safer than using the most likely value. Okay, so this is how we, we define 
uh, a first definition of what we can do. So let's consider this dose toxicity model, the probability of why one, this is BLT, so I have a toxicity here, given the dose, is a function with two parameters and x is the dose. See, this uh, coefficient here is going to be positive because you want something that is uh, uh, strictly increasing. Then you can define your gamma easily as that. And now let's suppose something. Let's suppose just for now, you're going to fix that and only worry about beta 1. Let's create a sequence of doses such that the first dose is the minimal dose as we are going to find the next dose based on inverse of my uh, posterior at, at that level alpha here. If I have the sequence, what we can show, and sorry for I'm going to skip because I messed up here. See, we can prove that this sequence conversion probability into the MTD. Uh, that is, this method is consistent. So this was done in 98. And this was, uh, again, the first time that in this area someone proved that their estimator was consistent. So let's back up a little bit and make it a little bit more complicated. See, one thing that was important here uh, is that we were giving our priors to this coefficient here. And this is something that we statisticians do all the time. But if I tell, suppose now that uh, we are considering now a logistic model, so that's the form of it, and I ask the physician, what do you think is the best prior for, more for my beta 1? How about my beta 0? See, it doesn't mean anything to them. And this was the mistake that another Bayesian method that was defined previous to ours, uh, they've done. It's called CRM, Continuous Reassessment Method. Uh, it's hard for anybody to figure out what was fine. But what can we do? Well, we just transform uh, those uh, two parameters into something that makes sense to them. One of them is the MTD itself, the gamma, and the other is what is the, the, the row zero, the probability of toxicity for the first one. So this, at least, you know how to uh, converse, talk to the clinicians. And this is what you do. So you create uh, this transformation. And now, uh, what you're going to do, you find within this interval, the minimal interval, the maximal interval, for the first uh, patient or cohort of patients, you're going to give the X mean, and then you start measuring the number of DOTs in this first, in this uh, end patients. See, that's going to be the likelihood, and see, this is your, that core here, that is just a, a, a logistic core with the transformations of your original beta zeros and beta ones. And you have your likelihood and you can move on. And how is the design? Well, so for the first patient, uh, we are going to assume that there is no DOT, so that's an assumption that if you have your first patient and you give uh, to this first patient your uh, lower dose and you have a DOT, that's not good. You need to back up or uh, think of a lower dose for the next one. Let's then assume that the first dose is really safe and the probability of DOT is very low. Then you start, uh, you see if you have DOT or not. You have your prior based on rho zero and gamma, and uh, you keep going on your trial. And how, uh, another important thing is, is how this alpha will play a role here. Because you can think of that uh, uh, feasibility parameter as to this uh, loss function. See, uh, the, the, depending on, if this alpha is 0.5, that means that you are giving to the patient the median of your posterior distribution. Any number less than that, you are going to give a lower number. And that means that if you, uh, if alpha uh, is smaller than 0.5, see, the, what you're saying is that you don't, you trying to have overdose is worse than underdose. Underdosing a patient is safe, so it's okay. Overdosing is bad, so I want to avoid that. And with alpha, you can change that during the trial, as we normally do. In the beginning of the trial, we start with a very slow, no, uh, very low number of alpha, and then you slowly increase to 0.5. So we saw that one. And this is an example of another trial that uh, just a, see, the first example that I gave was never published as a paper. We will we'll see a, a comment on that later. And this thing also. So in this trial, the theta 
that we wanted to target was 0.33 a third, and your alpha was 0.3. So for the zero patient, we have a uniform prior between the dose range. So this is, you see, the same thing in this cube. Uh, after five patients, your posterior is like that, so you learn something. And as you keep going, it gets uh, narrower and narrower up to the they decided to stop at patient 33 because this was the budget of the trial and you learned a lot. So you, you, uh, the, the mode and the median are almost the same, so this is almost symmetric distribution. But when you look at the 95 HPD, you see it's still very wide. So it's, uh, you, it requires a lot of patience if you want to have a lot of precision in your estimate. Okay, and if you want to use that method, we have a very nice uh, user-friendly software. So you Google, you walk home, and you give your username, password, or, uh, your email if you want to get from, uh, any data back from us, and you can play with this algorithm. So this was one of the problems. See, uh, to that that name is not here anymore, that is not here anymore, but this was an exact method. So because we have few number of parameters, we can do a quadrature, we don't need MCMC. And when we submitted grants to try to get funded here, they would say, why are we not using MCMC in such a hot area in research? We don't need it. We have two or three parameters, we can do a quadrature. Okay, and these are the, up to now, we, 20 trials have used our method. And uh, this is a very uh, underestimated number of trials that use the model because uh, different from many areas in research, uh, people that do phase one trials are mainly sponsored by pharmaceutical companies and they don't care about publishing the results. So the two examples I showed to you, they haven't been published ever, but there, the, at least 20 papers have used that. This is in blue because it's kind of funny, they apply this method for mice. They, so they will be ethical with mice. It's kind of, after that, they kill the mice. Uh, and this is the, the real uh, uh, core of our paper. So, uh, two years ago in June, uh, oops, we presented uh, uh, this protocol. So, that's the unit uh, of a clinical trial to FDA. And uh, then you, you get to interact with the guy, and then they, say, they end up saying, no, we shouldn't use EWAP. We want you to use acceleration titration. So, so what is accelerated titration? Uh, this method was first proposed by STAR, and it's a variation of what we call up and down design. Um, it, it, there are very interesting stories about this design, but uh, I don't like it because 98% of the trials currently being run use that method. And it, was, it started to be used in 1971, and since then, more than a hundred papers, statistical papers, show that that method is bad. But still, it's still being used. So, it's kind of my personal quest to try to change that proportion. And what is this up and down design? See, it's the, the reason why it's so uh, used is because it's very easy. You take three patients, you treat these three patients at one dose level. If you have no toxicity, you go to another dose level that you pre-specified before the experiment. So you're not even trying to gradate the dose based on your information. Before the experiment, you say, I have 10, 20, 30, 40, and then so you go to the next level. If you have one toxicity, you expand that. You have three more patients. If you have the toxicity in one out of the six, you go to the other level. If you see two or more toxicity, the previous level, you declare the MTD. So, and if on the outset you see two or three patients, the previous level is the MTD. So this is an algorithm. So, and it's any, see, you really don't need to be very smart to apply that. And that's why maybe it's so, so, so used, because you just follow the algorithm. So how good is that algorithm? And how did it appear? See, that's uh, uh, cool, because this was developed during, at the end of the Second World War, for those guys, Dixon and Wood, and they had a similar problem uh, in their lives. Uh, at that time, airplanes would release uh, explosive charges, 
and uh, depending on the height that you release them, they would explode or not. See, what's the similarity between the patient and an explosive charge? Well, if you treat one patient and you get DOT, you are not going to use that patient again. If you, if you don't have a DOT, you are not going to use that patient again either. See, if you release a charge and it explodes, you cannot use it. If you release it, it doesn't explode, you are not going to use it again. So that's the, the similarity. And see, the charges are cheap compared to patients. And they figure out that if you have around 30 or 40, you get a good estimate of which height you should release your charge, and a given percent of them would explode. Okay, so this is, that's the method we are competing with, but there is a, a little, sorry, to, we are not here yet. Uh, what is the accelerated titration? The accelerated titration, they decide, because this going three patients, one, uh, or two have BLT and then you do this process, uh, it's kind of slow if you are too low, if you start too low. Then one guy said, how about if we get, a, we add an ad hoc uh, difference? We do one patient at a time. And if we see in any patient uh, grade two toxicity or grade three or four, then we move to the three plus three. Okay? So again, very simple, any person can do it. You preset your doses before, and you follow those rules. So, uh, and I'm probably not going to discuss too much of that here. Uh, you, what we've done with you work is to, before this uh, uh, interaction with the FDA, is to say, yeah, it, it, it makes sense to use more information than the DOT. How about if we use great two toxicity, in a sense that if you have uh, in your experiment uh, no grade 2 toxicity, uh, you can uh, escalate more than if you have had one before. So what you can do, you can use a proportional odds model. You, uh, your y is instead of being just 0 and 1, now it's going to be 0, 1 and 2, and you're going to accommodate grade 2 toxicity or grade 3 or 4 toxicity. Then you have a little bit more an extension of, of your logistic model, and you do all the stuff. So the only new uh, parameter that you have, you're going to have a different baseline here for your uh, grade 2 toxicity. And I will skip that. So you, you are statisticians, you don't need to, to read that. You're also read that. Okay, so if I ask you, how do you compare two designs? regarding accuracy, precision, safe, safety, and number of patients receiving optimal designs. I bet that 100% of you will say, oh yeah, let's do same, uh, computer simulations, let's simulate the populations and see what method uh, performs the best. That's a very interesting thing, because if you ask the same question for your niche, they say, how about if we do a randomized control study comparing the two methods? So then you need to explain, uh, yeah, we have a little problem here, because can you imagine how many phase one clinical trials we need to perform to learn something? And if we use one drug, it's only going to be valid for that drug. And moreover, we have another problem. Suppose that this arm is in walk, this other is 3 plus 3. If you have in those one, a toxicity in one arm, it would be unethical not to communicate with the other arm. So the, the bottom line is that there is no way of comparing methods uh, unless you do computer simulation. And that's what we are going to do. So the next uh, session here is how we are going to set up that. Uh, when you do computer simulation, see, one thing that everybody does, the first thing to compare is to be uh, biased toward yourself. If, my, if I'm using a logistic model as a link function, I simulate my data according to logistic model. Then we are going to use other link functions and non-proportional odd models for to go against the, the assumption of proportionality of odds in the other reward model. We are going to have then the responses are the types of toxicity that we generate those functions. We are going to only work with one theta, 0.33, the dose range is between 0 and 1. We always normalize the dose between 0 and 1. 
But dose zero doesn't mean that it's the dose zero, it's the minimal dose you'll be using. And we are going to try several MTDs. The MTD in the lower range of the doses, in the middle and the higher end. And the other parameter is this uh, row one, that's the probability of a DOT or grade two toxicity at the minimum dose that we are going to uh, choose uh, among those three values here. So see, having those combinations here, we have nine scenarios. And then we are going to have eight types of designs. One is the EWARP as we define it. The other one is the proportional odds EWARP. And then the acceleration titration, we are going to have one, two, three, four, five, six different types. And how how are they different? They can be have the starting dose very low or a little bit low. They, the first phase, the way you accelerate, is going to be doubling the dose or going 1.69 of the dose or 1.96 of the dose. And why we chose one of these numbers? Because I forgot which one of them, but I think that this, this one was the one suggested by the FDA. And the others are also used in the literature. So see, this is a lot of things to, to simulate. And the, this, the, the final number here is once you get to the uh, up and down design, the 3 plus 3, what will be your rate of increase? For each scenario, we have 1,000. The number of patients uh, for trial for your walk is going to be 30. And for this one, it's complicated because it's an algorithm. See, it, it ends when it ends. So you cannot control the exact the sample size. So it's going to be at least 62, but most of the time it's going to be less than that. And these are the priors we use for the MTD, for the dose, the initial dose, uh, the probability of toxicity, grade 2 or DOT, given this one. Oh. Okay, so this is the, the, the drawing of the models. For, this is really the most important part. So if the true MTD is 0.1, you want this, this is your true MTD. And all the different models, the normal with the sigma 0.5, the sigma 0.2, the non-proportional odds with those parameters, see they're all passing through the same point, but they have different inclinations. Only the black one here is the logistic one. And you see the influence here and here. And this is how it looks like for the other uh, grade two or high probability of toxicity. And these are the results. So this is for bias. Uh, for MTD, uh, very low, 0.1, see, all methods are good. If the MTD is 0.5, see, the black ones, the square is you walk, the diamond is uh, you walk proportional odds. So they are all here, and all the methods are, the accelerated iterations are on the upper side. Is this a new data? Well, nobody has done with accelerated titration, but we know that for the 3 plus 3, the up-and-down design, that's how they perform. How about the root of the MSE? It, the same thing, if you are in the low end, all the methods are okay, and then you want to be low here, the walk is low, and proportional odds you walk are low, and the others are very high. How about the average proportion of DOT? So, you want your work to be 0.33 or less. So this is what happens here. But it's hard to know exactly what should be happening with the other methods. And one thing that is scary is some of them are going to have 50% of their results with DOT. Another way to uh, analyze safety is to say, what is the proportion of DOT uh, uh, that is less or more than theta 0.33 plus 5%. So then again, most of the time everything is okay except those guys with accelerated titration. And how about how often the MTD is within a good range? See, those guys are okay, but those are the same guys that are 50% of DOTs. See, you walk and you walk variations are all good here. And how about the number of patients that receive doses within the optimal thing. Now you want is always the winner. Okay, and, uh, so sorry, uh, I don't know if I said that, 
this data here is all for logistic uh, link function. So see, this is the best case for Ebola. So now, and this is the median number of patients per trial. See, Ebola is always 30, and the other methods, they vary. Sometimes 10 patients, the trial stops. Sometimes you need 50 patients. Okay, so this is uh, going not to use. This was the method, uh, the proportional odds method. So this is the, how the work was defined. And then you have all the other variations. And uh, these are in red, the accelerated iteration. This is the work, and this is proportional odds. And these are the number of sim uh, trials simulated in each case. So. In the first one, we've done a lot of different combinations, and here we decreased a little bit. And in one, it doesn't have many things to vary, so it's, the numbers are smaller than the accelerated range. So let's remove this, and what can we learn? So, see, this is average bias. So bias is always lower for the EWARCs. And this number that you see is the difference between this number and that number. So. This gives you a magnitude of that difference, okay? So how about the average square root of the mean square error? See, same thing, the walk is always low compared to acceleration penetration, and that number measures the difference. How about the average proportion of DLEs? Okay. walk is safe, it's always below Three, no matter what model are you using. And these are the differences, but sometimes the accelerated gives these overshoots here that are dangerous. The same thing, again, in the proportion of patients receiving optimal doses. So, see, this is the, one of the important parameters. And you can see that the walk is always much higher than the other one. And these are the differences in numbers. So see, that's the, the question. If you, if you could ask a patient uh, which method you would like to be used in your trials. Well, if I am that patient, say, well, I, I rather have one that increases my probability of getting a useful dose. Okay? So and that's the summary. That you have, uh, uh, in terms of accuracy, the bias in your walk is always smaller than acceleration hydration, precision, the e walk is always smaller, safety both are safe except some cases that accelerated hydration overshoots, and in terms of number of patients receiving optimal doses, is always more in terms of e walk. Okay, so what can I say? See, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, citations of a, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, theater plays from Bertolt Brecht, The Life of Galileo. The truth is the child of the times, not of the authority. Or in Portuguese, that I heard the first time, a verdade é filha do tempo e não da autoridade. And uh, see, for a couple of us here that uh, were uh, in our youth during the military dictatorship, that meant a lot. And the funny thing is, now I live in LA, and uh, two blocks from where I work, uh, they, there is this coronet theater. And I didn't know that thanks to, to Wikipedia, but the last version of uh, that uh, play uh, was the uh, first run in this theater. So, see, I always thought that LA was a kind of a shallow city in terms of intellectuality, but here, even very little pressure. Okay, so if we have a little bit of time, uh, this is uh, other questions that physicians normally ask me. So, okay, so you used one patient at a time in your uh, method. How about if you use three patients at a time to be more fair, fairer to the, the AT design? Oh, there is not much difference. If you study those parameters here, bias, the ones you, you're tired of seeing, see the difference of using one patient per cohort or three, there is no difference. It's almost the same. How about uh, yeah, so the same thing here now vary that epsilon, because people will say, oh, but you, you presented the results only with one epsilon. Okay, we are varying the epsilon and showing there is no difference. Uh, what else uh, can we study in terms of e -walk? Oh, how about the precision that you get by increasing the sample size? Okay, so this is, again, it was a different uh, paper published 
that we studied well, what is the sample size needed for a given precision in your uh, HPD. And perhaps the most interesting one, see, in what what is different from accelerated titration, it's a design consideration, the choice of your data. And why this is important? Because sometimes before you start your trial, you see from animal studies that the DOD is bad. For example, it's non-reversible. You get blindness or you die simply. So see, for that type of, uh, of drug, you want this to be really small. If it's easily reversible, you can use 40%, even 50%. Uh, and, but you see, the effect on the sample size is, is really big. So if you really want to have this data small, you require almost double the sample size than if you double data. Okay, and this is, so this was present and this is what we are doing right now. One thing that is very interesting, so if everybody thinks about that line and finding your NTD, unless you are a 3 plus 3 additional. But if you take two drugs, now you have, see your NTD is a line, so you have infinite those combinations. And that's the really the cool thing, because people don't think about those as being continuous. They normally they assign a small subset of doses, five, six, and then they do some combinations. So there is a difference between selecting one combination among all others and finding all possible doses that can have the same uh, probability of DOT. And you can imagine that for some patients, maybe this combination is better than that combination. So this opens a new window of uh, potentially combinations you can try to achieve the best solution. And this is two drugs. And most of the treatment, most of the patients with cancer have at least two drugs, sometimes three or more. So then you can say, hey, couple of models, how about uh, three, uh, my three drugs interaction? So, so you have a, a lot of uh, work to be done in that area. And this is what you get when you do a trial like that. So this paper is, is almost accepted in statistical medicine. Uh, you start, uh, this is the, the, the first attempt, and then you iterate, and when you get, see, the reds are DLTs, the whites are no DLTs. At the end of your trial, see, this is the, the it's a simulation, the continuous is the true MTD, and the dotted line is the estimated MTD. And so far, we, we have been very lucky in getting very good agreement with that. And that's what we are working right now. Uh, so this is the, the, just the summary of what we have been doing since 98. So we show that uh, Iwak is an Bayesian adaptive design. The, phase, the first publication uh, proposing this overdose control was in 98. Different from the AT designs or the 2 plus 3 design, at the end of the trial we have a precision. See, at the end of the trial they cannot even get you a confidence interval. Why? Because they have three to six patients in that uh, last dose. So with the convergence is uh, shown, the flexible patient enrollment, you can enroll at any time any number of patients. See, we are patients. More information, okay, you accept the initial discretion. This is not going to change any statistical properties of your estimators. Uh, we have free software. Uh, Murad, my colleague, uh, uh, have uh, uh, extended the uniform or beta priors to a more uh, rich class of priors. And this probably is the most interesting thing with covariates, from, at least from my perspective. We develop, there are some agents that you know before the patient is treated, that this may influence the dose. And we develop some methods and apply it in some real trials. And at the end of the trial, some patients were getting 100 times more of the agent than others. And the average probability of toxicity was still the, the, the one we wanted in this particular trial point one. Uh, this coherence, this is not a statistical coherence, but it means that uh, if uh, you walk is coherent uh, in the sense that if you have a dose and you see a DOT, the next dose will always be less. If you give a dose and you don't see a DOT, the next dose is always going to be more. And many methods don't have that property. 
the origin of toxicity rates, you already saw an application. This is a, a proportional odds model. You saw some of the results from cohort and sample size. And this was just accepted before I came here in terms of time to toxicity. Uh, most of the trials, you set the window of, the, of observation for between uh, two weeks uh, and a month. Uh, and so it's zero one binary. But sometimes, like in radiotherapy, it takes many months to see toxicity. So if you have a time to toxicity instead of a binary outcome, it's much more interesting to, to model that reality. And this works well. And finally, the drug combinations. So these are, if anybody's interested, this is there. These are the papers we have been published in the past decades. And uh, this is my colleagues that have been working to run. So he's my very good colleague and friend that has been working that for a long time. Stephen is my actual boss, that's why he's here. Oops, I'm just kidding, Stephen. I'm on TV now. Uh, and those are the developers for the software. So thank you very much.